Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. We want to invite you to stand to your feet and worship. If you're online, thanks for being with us. Let's worship together. Here we go. Tries to roll over my bones. And sorrow comes to steal the joy I own. When brokenness and pain are all I know, oh, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. Come on, we sing it together. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I. out of breath. Uh, you know you're out of shape when you give out of breath singing. My Apple Watch just called an ambulance. It should be up here in just about a second. Man, we are so excited to have you guys with us. If you are here on campus in one of the different venues or whether you are watching us online, we want to say welcome. And if it is the first time that you are worshiping with us, we are so glad you're with us. We hope you are blessed by what happens today. There is a very, very helpful digital gift that we want to send you to say thank you. So if you're a guest, I want you to take out your phone, text the word guest to the number 
396-6861. Way to go, man. Good job. And if you're a guest, you have no idea how hard it is for me to say that. Uh, well, I'm not going to have you text a word or a number or anything like that. But if you want to give, we do have opportunities for you to give, whether you are here on campus. In the lobby, there is secure electronic giving, and there's also a basket for you check writers. Drop one in there. T-U-C-K is how you spell my last name. You just put that in the memo section and we'll be just fine. Or if you're streaming online, there should be a link to online giving because we want to give you an opportunity to give. Does anybody else feel like the only thing that's helping us get through 2020 is prayer? Amen. My goodness gracious. We are so thankful that God has made a way for us to approach his throne. And we want to do that for you. So however we can pray for you, we want you to fill out an online prayer request form. You can find it on our website, on our mobile app, whatever platform you're watching on online, there's a link there. Please allow us to pray for you before the end of the day. Absolutely. We want to pray for you. We are always excited to be able to do that. And we're excited to announce that, uh, as we mentioned last week, we are going to return to normal programming, whatever normal looks like in the future, on August the 2nd. That's going to be two Sunday morning services. That's going to be full kids and middle school programming. We can't wait to get back to worshiping in all the areas of our church. And that same week, starting August the 3rd, we are going to have live, in-person, vacation Bible school. We are super, super excited. We've already got 150 kids signed up for vacation Bible school, which just shows you, absolutely, which just goes to show you that parents are ready to strangle their children. <laughs> because they're ready to send them out into a large group during a pandemic. That tells you what life is like uh, at home. And, and here's the thing, uh, we're gonna do all of this outside. Uh, preschoolers will be inside for just a few minutes for Bible story. Um, so we are gonna social distance, we're gonna have hand sanitizer, we're gonna have masks. We're gonna have it all uh, in one way, shape, or form. And man, it just goes to show you how times have changed. I'm a child of the 70s, and if this had hit during the 70s, my mom would have had me sharing a toothbrush with somebody <laughs> that tested positive because that's just how we did that stuff. If a kid in the neighborhood got chicken pox, she said, go to his house because you need to get it. But thankfully, we don't live in the 70s anymore. We live in the 21st century. If you just logged in, he wasn't saying to do that. No, Rewind, don't do that. watch the whole statement. Yes, watch it all, absolutely. So, Vacation Bible School, if you've not signed your kids up yet, do that. Preschoolers, you'll have an opportunity. Preschool parents, you'll have an opportunity to actually stay with your kids. So, if you hadn't had enough of them in the past four months, then you can sign them up for VBS and you can stay with them the whole time. You can helicopter right over them and it'll be absolutely okay for you to do that. I have had a few experiences this week that have to do with my kids, but that's probably not the coolest one that I had. Let me tell you what happened to me this week. I was listening to a podcast, and the podcast host asked the guest who their favorite preacher was. Good question. The host said, can't be related to you, but it's got to be somebody that you love to hear preach. And the guest said, man, there's so many. And then she said, my favorite preacher is Dr. Danny Aiken. Wow. Now, what you guys may know or may not is that Dr. Danny Aiken is the president of the Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in Wake Forest. What you probably don't know is that today he is preaching right here at OBC. You guys Absolutely. welcome Dr. Danny Aiken. Yes. We are super excited. My favorite preacher is Steve Griffith. I just want everybody to... <laughs> just in case there was a question. And he's all of our favorite preacher. But the truth is, I mean, can you imagine being Pastor Steve in this season, in the year 2020, preaching, bringing us the word in such great ways every week, leading us through a, glo a, glo a global pandemic, and at a really, really difficult time in our culture, he is pointing us back to the truth of the Bible. Can you imagine what that's been like this year? Yeah, amen. So, so every summer, he takes a, a little bit of time off from preaching. And those are times where, like last week, we got to hear uh, Dr. Samuel Thomas 
Today, we'll get to hear Dr. Danny Aiken, and for the next few weeks, we'll hear some pastors on staff, and um, man, you guys get it. If you've been here a little while, uh, when you see the men that God has called up through the local church to, to preach and teach and, and feed us on their word, it's, it's really a special time. Yeah, but next week is going to stink. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you in advance, and I would stay home if it was me, honestly. <laughs> it's a good day to watch online would be next week, for sure. <laughs> All right, I think that's it for us. You guys stand up, wave to the person next to you, and say, don't come next week.
What a name. What a Savior. What a God. Hey, let's pray together to him right now. Lord Jesus, oh, how we love you. We want to express that, Lord, as we, as we sing, as we worship, as we meet and gather here today. And whether that be in this room physically or even online, Lord, just the fact that we are joining our hearts together right now, Lord, we want to acknowledge right now how wonderfully good you are. The way that you love us, the way that you provide for us, God, the way that you protect us.
I want to invite you this morning to join me in the last book of the Bible. As you came in, you should have received an outline that has both the title of the message, uh, the text, and it provides an outline that will guide our study, The Lion, the Lamb, and the World, from Revelation chapter 5, beginning with verse 1 and going through verse 14. And let me just say, uh, that word is revelation, not revelations. There's not an S at the end. Now, it is true. There are many revelations in the book, but it is the revelation which Jesus Christ gave to his servant John, who then has given it to us. And of all the 22 chapters in this magnificent book, I don't think any is more important and more glorious in honoring to Christ than this fifth chapter. When I was in graduate school at the University of Texas at Arlington, uh, I encountered there, as you would expect, a, a wide variety of worldviews. Think about what it would be like to be in a graduate program at Carolina uh, or at State, or I can just keep on going across our particular state. And I was there among many, many people who looked at life in a radically different uh, way than, than did I. Now, there were people in the program of study just like me, Bible-believing, uh, evangelical Christians committed to a supernatural worldview, affirming all that the Bible teaches and proclaims. Uh, there were others in the program who actually referred to themselves as neo-Orthodox Christians. You say, what in the world does that mean? Well, a neo-Orthodox says something like this, I don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, but I think it can become God's word to me in a subjective, uh, existential kind of encounter. And most of those that fall into that camp would say, oh, I believe the Bible is fallible and the Bible has mistakes, but God can use it in an infallible way in my experience. And then I had classmates that, again, without any reservations, would say, well, I'm a liberal Christian. And by that, they meant something like this. I don't believe in supernaturalism. In fact, I don't believe that Jesus walked on water. I don't believe that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Uh, I don't believe Jesus was virgin born. I'm very skeptical about the resurrection of our Lord. But I do like the moral teachings of the Bible. Wouldn't the world be better if we lived by the Ten Commandments? Wouldn't the world be better if we were to lead, uh, live by the teachings we find uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. And then, of course, I encountered people from different religions altogether. I had classmates, not many, but a few, uh, that were Buddhist, that were Hindu, uh, that were Muslim, and I did have quite a few classmates that were Jewish. Interestingly, most of my professors, with only a couple of exceptions, would have said again without any apology, uh, I am an agnostic, uh, I am an atheist. Now, I can still remember one evening in a class on rhetoric uh, taught by a man that uh, was without any apology an avowed atheist. Uh, I don't remember what was going on, but a young lady in the class raised her hand. He recognized her and she said, well, I just want to ask you a question in light of what you've been saying this evening. What do you believe the future holds for mankind? And this professor waited for a few moments and then he responded, and I've never forgotten it to this day. He said, well, I'm not very hopeful about the future. When I look at the world today, I discover that man does not treat man very well. In fact, when I study history, I discover that humanity has never treated humanity very well. And so he hesitated again, and then he said this, I believe the future holds for humanity, for mankind, certain destruction and potential annihilation. I am not very hopeful about the future. Now, let me put my cards on the table before we go to the text this morning. If I were an atheist, if I were an agnostic, if I believed as the Humanist Manifesto 1 and 2 both affirm that ultimately man must save himself, then I agree with that professor. I have no hope for the future. 
I anticipate that humanity will destroy, if not annihilate itself. I have no hope if man must save himself. But that's where Revelation chapter five becomes so very, very important. Because if I were to summarize for you all this morning what this passage is going to teach us, I could do it with a little song that I was taught as a little boy in a Baptist church in Atlanta, Georgia, and that little song simply says this, speaking of our God, he has got the whole world in his hands. This world is not out of control. This is not a world where man must save himself. How do I know? Because Revelation 5 teaches us there is right now today a lamb sitting on a throne in heaven. And he is guiding, and he is directing, and he is orchestrating all things to their perfect, divine, climactic ending. No, he's there, and he has got the whole world in his hands. And so as we walk through these 14 verses this morning, I want to show you three overarching truths and then some supporting truths that help us understand how as we live through a global pandemic— as we try to navigate all of the um, upheaval and all of the strife and all of the anger and all of the suspicion in America today, we need to rest in the reality that there is a lamb sitting on a throne, this lamb who is also a lion. And so what do we see in Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 14? Well, number one, I want you to see this. Jesus Christ is the Lord because he is the Lord of history. Look at chapter 5 and let me read for you verse 1 down through verse 5. Then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, and here's the key question that drives Revelation 5, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? Well, here's the answer. No one, no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and uh, its seven seals. Now, the first thing I want you to see in the first five verses is this. Jesus Christ is Lord because of God's plan. Look at it again. Then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. In the Semitic mind, the right hand is the hand of authority. Of course, the throne, a word that occurs more than 40 times in Revelation, is the place of authority. So get the vision before your mind's eye. At the place of authority, the throne, and in the right hand, the hand of authority, John says, I saw a scroll, a book, and it was filled with information because it was written within, and it was written on the back, and uh, it was perfectly sealed up because it was sealed with seven seals. Now, a million-dollar question begs to be asked. What is the scroll that's in the right hand at this moment of God the Father as he sits on the throne in heaven? Well, there have been all sorts of uh, speculative answers given. Some have said it's a title deed to the earth. Some have said it is the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. Some, going back to particular Old Testament texts, say that it must be a book of judgment, and it is certainly that. But really, I think the easiest answer is this. The scroll in the right hand of God the Father is the remainder of the book of Revelation. It may have some connection with a book in Daniel chapter 12 because Daniel at the end of his book, is given a vision from an angel. But before Daniel can unveil the vision, he is told by the angel, stop, seal 
up the vision until the time of the end. And so it may be, I think it is, that the vision denied Daniel is now granted to the Apostle John. And it contains Revelation 6 through Revelation 22. Now, we don't have time, but if we were to quickly survey these chapters, what would we discover about this scroll that is in the right hand of God the Father? And I think you could say it this way. Number one, it's a book of judgment. Number two, it's a book of redemption. And number three, it is a book of of restoration. So if you're a note taker, one more time, Revelation 6 through 22 is a book of judgment. It is a book of redemption or salvation, and it is also a book of restoration. You say, well, why do you call it those three things? Well, first of all, it's a book of judgment because in Revelation 6, we are introduced to the seal judgments. In Revelation 8 and 9, we're introduced to the trumpet judgments. In Revelation 16, we are introduced to the bold judgments. And brothers and sisters, now listen to me. If the Bible is true, and I believe that it is, then it teaches that in the last seven years of history, more than one half of the world's population is going to die as a result of the righteous and just judgment of God upon a world that has shaken its fist in God's face and said, we will do it our way. We do not care about your world. We do not care about your glory. We will do it our way. And listen to me. I know COVID-19 is a bad bug. It is nothing compared to what we will see in the last days of human history, nothing. Through war, through pestilence, through disease. Now think about it, today, More than seven and a half billion people on planet Earth. Can you imagine what it will be like? Seven years, almost four billion people gone just like that, all because of the righteous judgment of a God on a world that has rejected his lordship. You say, well, Danny, then the the future is horribly, horribly pessimistic. No, no. Because amidst the storm clouds of God's judgment, there is a magnificent and beautiful silver lining. Let me just show you quickly part of it. Go over in your Bible for just a moment to chapter 7. And in chapter 7, there are two visions that you see. First of all, verses 1 through 8. Secondly, verses 9 through 17. Now, what do we see in Revelation chapter 7? Well, first of all, we see this. God is not through with the Jew. Indeed, in chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, 144,000 are sealed from the 12 tribes of Israel to do, I believe, fantastic and wonderful evangelistic work during the last seven years of history. We discover that this is in perfect harmony with what Paul says in Romans chapter 11 when Paul, looking to the end of time, says, there's coming a day when all of Israel will be saved. It's in perfect harmony with what the prophet Zechariah said in chapter 12 and verse 10. Speaking of the nation of Israel, he said at the end of time, listen, they will look upon him whom they pierced and they will weep as for an only son. There is coming a day when the Jewish people will recognize that they indeed crucified their Messiah and they will turn to him in repentance and faith and there will be a great revival among the Jewish people, but not just the Jewish people. Now, look at chapter 7 and verse 9. After this, that is after the vision of the 144,000 from Israel, after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. They were standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and they were clothed in the garments of salvation, white robes. They had palm branches in their hands, and they were crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now, drop down to verse 13. 
Then one of the elders addressed me. So one of the elders, I'll explain them in just a moment, talked to John, and they said, or he said, who are these that are clothed in white robes and from where have they come? And John says, in essence, I don't know, sir. You're the one who knows. And he said to me, now watch, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So the last seven years of history, a time of horrible judgment, yes, but also a wonderful, glorious time of salvation. So it is a book of judgment. It is a book of salvation. But thirdly, it is also a book of restoration. Revelation chapter 21 and 22, we read there of what? A new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. When I teach uh, theology at the seminary, and when I speak specifically of the doctrine of eschatology, the end times, I will say to my students that Revelation 21 and 22 is Eden regained and more. Eden regained and And more. In other words, everything we lost in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve fell into sin, we're going to get all of it back and even more. And so there's so many things I could share there, but just one verse. I I never do a funeral for a Christian that I do not read this verse. And over and over in my life, I return to this verse again when I am having a tough time going through a period of discouragement, I just remind myself, this isn't the end. There's something more wonderful coming. And just look at chapter 21 and verse four. What will the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem be like? Well, here's what part of it will be like. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things they have passed away. And so all of this is in that scroll in the right hand of God the Father. Yes, our God has a magnificent plan. But secondly, Jesus Christ is Lord because of heaven's problem. Go back now to chapter five and look at verse two. I saw a strong angel. He was proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals. And here's the answer. No one, no human, no angel, no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. So for just a fleeting moment, It looks like God's wonderful plan for the end of time and for all of eternity. It's not going to come to fruition because no one can open the scroll that will unfold all of these events. But then I want you to note, thirdly, Jesus Christ is Lord because of his power. Verse 4 says, I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders now, We're introduced to the elders in chapter four. There are 24 of them. I believe they represent the redeemed of all the ages, both Old Testament believers corresponding to the 12 tribes of Israel and New Testament believers corresponding to the 12 apostles. So one of the redeemed, one of the elders said to John, weep no more. Literally, it's an imperative. Stop crying, John. Behold, the lion of the tribe of of Judah, a wonderful messianic title found in Genesis chapter 49, informing us that the Messiah would be a great king. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. But secondly, he is also the root of David. That's another messianic title that we find both in Isaiah chapter 11, in Jeremiah chapter 23, as the root of David, we are taught not only will the Messiah come from the tribe of Judah, not only will he come from the lineage of David, not only will he be a great king, but as the root, he is the source of all the blessings 
that come to God's redeemed people. And so John is told, don't cry, don't weep. There's one coming. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the root of David and he's conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And so Jesus Christ is the Lord of history because of God's plan because of heaven's problem and because of his great power. But now number two, Jesus Christ is also the Lord of victory, verse six and verse seven. Now, when we come to verse six, we're surprised by what we read. We are told, look for a lion. I always think of Aslan uh, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Look for Aslan. Look for this great lion-like figure. Look for the root of David, but that's not what we see at all. And John's very dramatic in the way he unfolds the vision of verse six. Now, between the throne and the four living creatures, angelic beings of worship found also in chapter four, and among the elders, the redeemed, John says, I saw not a lion, John says, I saw not the root of David. No, I saw a lamb. He was standing, but he looked as if he had been slain. Now, I could spend several hours, I'm not going to, but I could spend several hours this morning and afternoon tracing for you the magnificent theme of the Lamb that runs all the way from Genesis to Revelation. But let me just give you the the Reader's Digest version this morning for our purposes. That word, Lamb, is a very particular word in the original language, the Greek language. It is a Greek word, arneos, arneos. It means a little pet lamb. The word occurs 29 times in Revelation. One time, it's not a reference to Jesus, but 28 times it is. That word also occurs only one time outside the book of Revelation. You say, well, where's that? John chapter 21, where Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Then you go and feed my what? Lambs. And so that's the only time this word occurs outside of Revelation. So 29 times in Revelation, 28 times a reference to Jesus. So that again, I would think, uh, would beg a question. Where's the one time, Danny, that the word lamb is used and it doesn't refer to Jesus? Well, this will be the last time we'll do a little Bible drill, but take your Bible and turn over for just a moment to chapter 13 and look at verse 11. Chapter 13 and verse 11. Now, let me give you the context, and again, Don't have time to do a full-blown prophecy conference, but if we did, here's what I would teach you. In chapter 12 and chapter 13 in Revelation, you are introduced to the great opponents, the great evil opposition that will come against our Lord at the end of time. You are introduced to a figure called the dragon, who is Satan. Then in chapter 13, verses 1 through 10, you're introduced to a beast who comes out of the sea. Now, we know the beast out of the sea more popularly by the name what? The Antichrist. The Antichrist. Now, this is fascinating to me. The word Antichrist never occurs in the book of Revelation, not one time. Most people don't know that, but it's not there. In fact, the word Antichrist only occurs in two books of the Bible, 1 John and 2 John. 1 John chapter 2 and chapter 4. And again in 2 John verse 7. Now stay with me. I know I'm throwing a lot at you. You can go back and get the tape and listen to it again a dozen times and put it all together. But here's what you need to understand. The person that John calls the beast out of the sea, he calls the Antichrist in his letters. Paul calls him the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So the one that Paul calls the man of lawlessness, John calls the Antichrist. Here in Revelation, he calls him the beast coming up out of the sea. Then in chapter 13, verses 11 through 18, 
we're introduced to, if you like, the minister of propaganda for the Antichrist. And look at what verse 11 says. Then I saw another beast rising up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. Now, listen to me very carefully this morning. I don't care what your eschatology is. I don't care. You can be premillennial and right, or you can be amillennial and postmillennial and wrong, okay? So just want to clear up that, all right? You can be premillennial and be right like your pastor and I, or you can be amillennial and postmillennial and be wrong. You can be pre-trib and right like your pastor and I, or you can be mid-trib, post-trib, partial rapture, pre-wrath rapture. I don't care. We can all agree on this. In chapter 12 and chapter 13, we are introduced to nothing less than a counterfeit trinity. The dragon Satan counterfeits God the Father. The beast of the sea, the Antichrist, counterfeits God the Son. And the false prophet, who is later described by that word, is the person of chapter 13, verse 11 through 18. He counterfeits the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. And what does it say about how he does things? One more time, verse 11, I saw another beast rising up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. He looks like a friend, but he speaks like the dragon. We all know the saying, don't we? Looks can be what? deceiving. And listen to me very carefully. This individual will come on the scene at the end of time, and he will give every appearance that he's on God's side. My goodness, he may have a seminary degree. He may on a regular basis stand behind a pulpit and have a Bible in front of him. My goodness, he may be ordained and licensed and have all the credentials, but here's the deal. The Bible says, don't you pay too much attention to how he looks. You pay a lot of attention to what he says. Listen, I don't care if he's on TV. I don't care if he's got a podcast that attracts millions. I don't care if he's got a big smile and wears nice clothes. I don't care. What counts is what comes out of his mouth. And by the way, that's true for me. Bottom line this morning, if you're here and you're listening or you're online and you're watching, if what I say this morning does not match up with this book, you should reject me as a false prophet and a false teacher. However, if what I do say does match up with this book, you are under a moral and spiritual obligation to obey it and to follow it, not because of Danny Aiken, but because I have been a faithful deliverer of the word of God. Of God. Now, go back to chapter 5. We're going to pick up the pace, and I want you to see the beautiful portrait that we have of the real Lamb of God. Five quick observations about him. Number one, he is a victorious Lord because he was slain. The Bible says there, I saw amidst the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as though he had been slain. For all of eternity, I believe our Lord will bear the marks of his sacrifice, reminding us for all of eternity, without the shedding of his blood, there could be no forgiveness of sins. He was slain. But secondly, he's victorious because he's standing. It says there, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Having been slain speaks of his crucifixion. Standing speaks of his glorious resurrection. So he was slain, he is standing, but thirdly, he is victorious because he is strong. Look at what it says there in verse six. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all of the earth. First of all, he has seven horns. Now, what in the world does that mean? A number of years ago, When we were living in Dallas, Texas, I was invited to come to a church and to speak on the subject of biblical prophecy. And so evidently, I decided that a good thing to do that morning on Sunday was to bring the study to a close by preaching from Revelation chapter 5. 
we got in our van to go home, and my four sons, uh, at that time, uh, they were adolescents. None of them were teenagers yet. Uh, they were in the back, and suddenly one of them, probably Jonathan, he was always the spokesman when it came to a theological issue. And so he said, Daddy, this morning you preached about Jesus, and you said he has seven horns sticking out of his head, which I actually felt very good about that because that meant my goodness, my, my, my adolescent sons were listening and paying attention to what, what daddy was preaching on this morning. And so I said, yes, I did say that uh, the Lord Jesus has seven horns. And they said, well, he said for them, well, we don't like that. That, that, that scares us. And if that's what he looks like in heaven, then we don't want to go to heaven. Well, that caused a very uh, a crisis of enormous fortune at that moment when your children are saying they don't want to go to heaven. And so I looked at their mother, and she said, no, you preach the text, you fix the problem. <laughs> gave, gave, me, gave me no help at all. I mean, zero, nada. So I began to rack my brain very rapidly, and here's what I came up with. I said, okay, guys, let me, let me see if I can help. Who is our favorite professional football team. Now, understand, I didn't live here where you're like close to God-forsaken, antichrist, redskin territory. I wasn't close to that junk. And we didn't have the Panthers back then, all right? So we lived in Dallas. So I said, well, you know who's our favorite football team? And, they, and by the way, this was during the Tom Landry years, okay? This is before the antichrist Jerry Jones took over. No, I'm just kidding. That's just a joke. And if you can't handle a joke, get a life, all right? So I said, that's right. We love the Dallas Cowboys. Now, guys, I have a question. Are they really Cowboys? And they said, well, no, Daddy, they're football players. I said, you're right. So why do we call them Cowboys? And they said, well... Because cowboys are supposed to be strong and, and tough and, and rugged. And I said, that's right. It's a picture of what we hope our football team will be. And so I said, guys, here's what's going on. Revelation is highly symbolic language. I didn't use the word apocalyptic. I just said it's highly symbolic language. And he doesn't really have seven horns sticking out of his head. But the horns are a picture of power or strength. And the number seven in the book of Revelation almost always stands for that, which is perfect or complete. So when you put seven horns together, all the Bible is saying is that he has perfect power, that he is omnipotent. That's all that it's saying. So he is victorious because he's strong. He's the omnipotent one. But then number four, He's also victorious because he's searching. He has seven eyes. Now, what do eyes do? I see. Your eyes are the primary means whereby you and I gain knowledge. So you put it together, seven perfect, eyes knowledge. He has perfect knowledge. He's all-knowing. He is the omniscient one. But then number three, he is sovereign. And this may be the most difficult one of all and these are the seven spirits of God that are sent out where? Into all of the earth. Now you say, but Danny, they're not seven spirits of God. There's only one Holy Spirit. That's right. But what does the number seven stand for? Perfection, completion. So you put it together, the perfect Holy Spirit who does what? who goes out into all of the earth. He is also not only the omnipotent one, and the omniscient one, he is the omnipresent one. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He is everywhere present. He is God, and because of who he is and what he has done, verse 7, he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. One man in reflecting upon these verses, simply sat down and wrote this little poem. Mary had a little lamb. His soul was white as snow. And everywhere his father sent, the lamb was sure to go. He came to earth to die one day, the sin of man to atone. But now he reigns in heaven above. He's the lamb upon the throne. Jesus Christ, Lord of history, Jesus Christ, Lord of victory, and number three, Jesus Christ, the Lord 
of glory. Let me give you the outline very quickly so I can move through these verses quickly and bring our study to a close. What we're going to see in verses 8 through 14 are three magnificent hymns that are sung to the praise of the Lamb in heaven. The first hymn, number one, he is praised by the saints. The second hymn, sung by the angels. And the third hymn, sung by all the creation. So he is praised by the saints, praised by the angels, praised by all the creation. We'll just walk through them very quickly and bring our study to a close. Verse 8, and when he had taken the scroll, that is the son takes the scroll from the father, the lamb takes the scroll from the father. The four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. They were holding a harp, there's the instrument of praise, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So they go to their knees before the Lord Jesus with prayer and praise, and they sang a new song. Now, what kind of song did they, do they sing in heaven? Well, here's one example. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. Why? Four reasons are given. Number one, for you were slain. Number two, by your blood you have purchased or ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Number three, you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. As kings, we reign. As priests, we serve one another. And finally, looking, I believe, to the millennial kingdom of chapter 20, they will reign on the earth. Well, the angels are watching the saints sing, and they're not going to sit on the sideline. So look at what it says there in verse 11. I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voices of, of many angels. Why, they numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. The Christian Standard Bible says countless thousands plus thousands and thousands. The bottom line is there's so many angels, John says, I can't count them. But John would say, don't, don't worry about how many angels there are. Just pay attention to what angels do. In verse 12, they were saying, they were singing with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive what? A sevenfold or perfect blessing. To receive power and wealth, wisdom and might. Stop. Brothers and sisters, you can't give God any of those four things. You can't give God power. You can't give God wealth. You can't give God wisdom. And you can't give God might but you can give God the last three things and honor and glory. And the word blessing is the Greek word eulogia. We get our English word eulogy from it. It literally means to speak a good word. In other words, as long as you and I are on this earth and we have breath in our lungs, we have the privilege and the opportunity, the responsibility to say a good word about Jesus. Well, the song or the, 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 the hymn, the chapter concludes in a magnificent song, verse 13 and verse 14, I heard every creature in heaven and on earth, even under the earth and in the sea, and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne, God the Father, and to the Lamb, God the Son, be blessing and honor, glory and might forever and ever. In verse 14, the four living creatures said, amen, so be it. And the elders, they fell down and they worshiped. And some translations will add the phrase, and they worshiped him who lives forever and ever. You know, before we leave in just a moment, if those doors right there were suddenly to open and walking down here and standing in front of us was the governor of our state, Roy Cooper, whether you agree with his politics or not, he's our governor. And it would be appropriate for us to recognize his presence in this gathering today. That would be the right thing for us to do. It'd be right for us to, to pray for him because the Bible commands us to pray for all of those in positions of authority. And if in the next few moments before we leave, the doors were to open and suddenly walking down and standing in front of us was the President of the United States, President Donald Trump, whether you like his politics or not, he's our president. And it would be right for us to honor him, 
to respect him and to pray for him because he is the president. In fact, I, I would say, even though I don't always agree with him, there are things he does that, that drives me up a wall and makes me just nearly pull what little hair out I have left. Still, I'd stand in his honor and I would applaud if he were to be with us today. I would do that because he's the president. I want to tell you something. If suddenly standing here before us was the Lord Jesus, to clap would be so inadequate. And to stand and clap would almost be arrogant. It really would. You see, the only response, proper response to our great king, the lamb who sits on the throne, is what we see there in verse 14. They fell down. They put their knees and their face on the ground, and they worshiped him who lives forever and ever. That's what they do in heaven. That's what you and I should do in our hearts today. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this magnificent chapter. I've studied through it many times, and Lord, I never grow tired of reading the words. I never grow tired of studying them. I never get fatigued of proclaiming what's there because it paints such a magnificent picture of the one who is the lamb, who is also the lion sitting upon a throne in heaven. Indeed, he does have a beautiful, beautiful name. And yes, he is my king. And Lord, it is my prayer that if there's anyone here today, anyone watching online that has never bent their knee to King Jesus, repented of their sin, and put their faith and trust in his perfect atoning work on the cross and his glorious resurrection from the dead, I pray that, Lord, right now today, they would make that greatest and most important of all decisions, turning from their sin and turning to a Savior who will wash all of their sins away. You are a great Savior. You are a great Lord. You are a wonderful King. We worship you. We love you. We adore you. And we pray this this day in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.
From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of Thank you so much for being a part of the service today, whether you were here or you joined online. Thank you so much. I want to remind you, hey, God loves you. He's with you. He's for you. And if you did join us online, we want to remind you that you can click the links to give. We want to encourage you to do that as part of our worship. We do that. And God is doing some incredible things because you're so generous in giving. So we want to thank you for that. Also, we want to remind you that you can click the links online to pray. We want to encourage you to do that. We want to know how we can pray for you, whether it's for you or somebody else. Please fill those out. It's an honor and a privilege for us to pray for you. Hey, again, thanks for being a part of the service today. God bless you. We'll see you.